Our topic for tonight is entitled Redemption. So tonight I want to go through uh, a couple of slides and we want to talk a little bit about redemption. But one of the things that I also wanted to do in this session was to give you a scripture in which you would be able to explain redemption to somebody else on your own. So that's really my intention today, to look at some of the tenets of redemption and to also equip us with a scripture that will be able that we will be able to explain redemption to somebody else should they ask. So the text today is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter one and verse seven, and it reads, In whom we have redemption through his blood, and that's the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So that's our base scripture that we'll be looking at. So as we're going to our study tonight, let's see if we can get uh, a definition. When we say redemption, of what do we speak? What are we talking about when we say redemption? So there are several definitions. In fact, there are many definitions that are available we're just going to look at a couple here. And uh, I um, I won't be able to see too much on the screen, the participants, right? So if there's anything happening, um, post if you can make me aware, right? Please, thanks. All right. So redemption. One definition is the action of regaining, regaining, or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. So it sounds very much like buying or buying back something. It sounds like clearing a debt, paying a price to have a debt, something that was owed, cleared from against our names. Another definition, and more so related to Christianity, redemption refers to the action of saving, of saving or being saved from sin, error, or from evil. And then there are two other short of phrases that are very, very useful for a study. And uh, the first of those two will be redemption, meaning released by payment, released by payment. So that gives us the idea of something being withheld or something being held in captivity, but uh, through payment, it is being released. And fourth, freed by ransom. Again, the idea of captivity or something being withheld, but a ransom, a demand was made, a demand which was paid, and as a result of uh, that demand or ransom being paid, whoever or whatever it was, was able to be free. So those are some of the working definitions that uh, we can look at, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange or payment or clearing a debt, the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, and evil, released by payment, or freed by ransom. So we have an idea of what redemption is. So why do we need redemption? What is the importance of redemption? Why do we need this thing called redemption? Well, the definition that we give itself introduces the idea of regaining something that was lost. So we see regaining and we see lost. We see clearing a debt that was incurred and being released from captivity. So we see some opposites that are working here, being released from captivity, clearing a debt that is owed. We are clearing and regaining something that was lost. So it almost gives the idea of a reversal of something that was happening. This, uh, it's speaking here concerning humanity. When we talk about redemption, we're not talking about redeeming a plant, we're not talking about redeeming a car or, or some precious jewel or so. We are speaking about something far more important than that. We are speaking about humanity. So if we want to regain humanity, then humanity had to be lost. So humanity became lost when? In the Garden of Eden. Humanity became lost. And with that, the rights and the ownership over humanity 
was handed over to the devil. Now, God created us. On day six, God made man. God made, he, he formed Adam out of the dust of uh, the earth. He breathed life into him. He put Adam to sleep. He took out a rib. He made Eve. Humanity belonged to God. We were made by the hands of God and made alive by the breath of God. God had all legal right over us. But then we know in the Garden of Eden that something tragic happened there. The, the devil in the in the form of the serpent would have tempted Eve and uh, Adam as well. And uh, so in an act of deliberate disobedience, which was committed in the Garden of Eden, the rights and the ownership over humanity was transferred. It was handed over from being owned and from God having all rights over us. It was handed over to the devil because uh, of that act of disobedience, that going against the word of God. So humanity became lost and the rights were handed over to the devil. When Adam and Eve, when they gave in to the cunningness of the serpent, they traded a perfect relationship with God. Remember, they had such a relationship that God will come down in the cool of the evening and would talk and commune they traded in that perfect relationship with god and that was in a perfect place they traded that in and in that place they had dominion over everything every living thing but you know what when they gave in to the guile of the serpent they traded that in for something that was far inferior they traded it in for a life of sin a life of shame a life of suffering and a life of separation from God. And the real tragedy of that is that it would not only be for them. They would not be the only one having to face that consequence, but all who would be born of man and woman. So the whole of humanity, the all of mankind was plunged into sinful living. They were plunged. They were sold out in the Garden of Eden. And that's why we need redemption. And uh, however, in Genesis 3 and 15, that's the chapter right after in which God uh, comes into the scene again and he begins uh, to lay out consequences to the man and to the woman and to the serpent. And here God pointed towards a future hope. So it was lost. Humanity was lost and sold out at that point. But God pointed towards a future hope to the serpent. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, his heel. In other words, God was not going to take it just like that. God was going to do something about uh, what had happened. Man had fallen. God did not create man to be fallen. And God was saying he was going to do something to turn this uh, around and uh, in that whatever he was going to do, that plan that he had, it will result or there will be a clear enmity between, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And in that scripture, it spoke of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So humanity was lost, but redemption was going to bring humanity back to the state that God had designed. So it brings us to an important question. We are talking about redemption. So who, need, who needs redemption? Very simply, everyone is in need of redemption. I want us to understand that our natural condition being born of a sinful lineage or lineage was characterized by guilt and transgressions of the holy standards of God. All men who were born, all women who were born, children came out of the loins of Adam. And Adam himself had fallen. All of us are born with a sinful Adamic nature. That nature is marked by guilt. 
Guilt because we are not innocent. Guilt because we do the wrong thing. We are prone to the wrong thing. Transgressions because we are unable to keep up the holy standards of God. We are unable to do the right thing. The apostles say, you know what? The things that I know I should do, it's difficult for me to do. The things that I should stay away from, I find myself doing it. Almost as if there is a war. And it's the same for all of us. So we are unable to keep up the holy standards of God. And if we continue in this way, then we are doomed to destruction. And that destruction will be eternal. It will be irreversible. A scripture for that is Romans 3.23, which tells us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we all need redemption. Christ's redemption has freed rescued and deliver us, delivered us from this guilt, from that position that we are in. We are freed, we are rescued, and we are delivered. Our scripture, Romans 3 and 24, it says, being justified, and we spoke about justification, freely by his grace through the redemption, the buying back that is in Christ Jesus. So, Christ's redemption has freed, rescued, and delivered us from this guilt. All right? And in this, what we just said here, Bridget, I, I hope that we could realize the love of God towards us. How much God's, God loves us as mankind, as humanity. Because there were celestial beings that fell. Lucifer, we know, fell. And one third of the angels fell with him. Those were celestial beings. Those were made and created to be in the presence of God. In fact, they were in the very presence of God in the heavenlies. They fell. But we will notice that through scripture that there was no plan of redemption ever made for them. In fact, the scripture says that they are banished. They are banished until judgment. They will not come out of their fallen state. But you know what? Man also fell. Man also fell, and when man fell, even before the foundation of the world, the scripture tells us that there was a plan of redemption that was already established, already declared in the heavenlies. All right, so let's look a little bit of some Old Testament types of redemption, just to show that it was there in the Old Testament as well. Well, there are several, several examples. Let's just talk about a couple. One might be Noah. The story of Noah with Noah and, we know, of course, we know Noah and the ark. So what happened in Noah and the ark? Just in a nutshell, God was warning of a coming judgment that was going to be a worldwide punishment because God had, he had reached the conclusion where God said, listen, the heart of man is evil. Evil is ruling continually in the heart of man. And God was going to wipe out all of man. Those who repent of their sins and believe in the warnings of Noah, they were welcome to go aboard, to board the ark before the flood. However, after 120 years of preaching, the only people who stepped into that ark were Noah and his family. Eight souls we know were saved. While there was room for many, many, many more people, only eight were saved. Redemption was offered to all who were willing to repent and believe. However, only few accepted the offer. A second example might be Abraham and Isaac from Genesis 22. And we know that story where God had asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Through the whole process of going up to the mountains and all of that, Isaac was obedient and Abraham was hopeful. Abraham fully expected when he left there in obedience to God, he was going to do what God had told him to do. He had fully expected to sacrifice his child on the altar. But he was also confident that God could do something about it. God could raise back up his child to life if they need be. But he was committed to doing what God had said. All right? What Abraham did not expect was for God to have a different plan. That was not on the mind or on the heart of Abraham. But just before Abraham thrust the knife into the child as he laid on the altar, 
God provided a sacrificial lamb to take the place of Isaac. That there is an example of redemption. God redeemed Isaac with that ram. And it is an example, it's a type, it's a shadow of how God redeems us through the, the sacrifice of his son. So a third example could be the story of Ruth. And uh, I won't go into that because I think we are familiar with that story, how Boaz would have been the kinsman redeemer. And he would have rescued both Ruth and Naomi out of that situation. All right. So like I told you at the beginning, what I wanted to do as well, in addition to giving you some information, I wanted to present a scripture that we could use. Now, this is our base scripture, and this is a scripture that we want to look at. This scripture is loaded with a lot of information concerning redemption. And if we could go through it, we will be able to give an explanation of it to somebody else. We'll have a much better understanding of what uh, redemption is about. So I'm reading the scripture. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So, so what we want to do is to look at the scripture and we want to ask and answer several questions about it as we explore this text. So here are some of the questions we're going to ask. The first one is who is this we referring to? It says in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So we ask any question, who is this we referring to in the scripture? And to answer that, we go into the to the verses just above it verses 3 down to 7 7 is the verse that we are on we're taking it from 3 listen to how it reads it says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, and our base verse, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. So the we that he is speaking about is found in the previous verses. And I've highlighted, I've bold, sorry, I've put in bold some key phrases here. It says, and it's going to refer to it as us in the higher verses, blessed us. He had chosen us, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. In verse 6, had made us accepted in the beloved. And what verse 7 is saying, the we who have redemption. This is the category of people. This is the description that God is given concerning those who have redemption. They are blessed. They are chosen. They are predestinated unto adoption. They are made accepted in the beloved. This is a group of people that have redemption. And right there, I think we should give God a high note of praise because that description is a description of us. And I want you to know that all of these things that we are seeing here, God did that for us while we were yet sinners. We didn't have a thought concerning Christ. We were not good in ourselves. We had nothing good or lovely. We had no good intentions. Our heart were wicked and evil. But this is the description that God gave of us. And he did it for those who would have redemption. He did it while we were yet sinners. So the we is talking about this group of people. All right? It's talking about this group of people. I want to go a little bit further than that. I want to say that this we refers to Christian people. It refers to Christian people. This verse does not refer to the unsaved. The unsaved do not fit this description. The unsaved do not have 
redemption. This refers to Christian people who have responded to the gift of grace and who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you have responded to the free gift of grace, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are part of this group. You are blessed, you are chosen, you are predestinated unto the adoption of children. You are made accepted in the beloved and you have redemption. Redemption, I want to say this again, is offered to all. The Bible says that whosoever, whosoever, it is offered to all. But it is dependent now upon who would accept it. Those are the ones that will be able to access this redemption. But redemption is provided for all. So that's one thing we could take out of that scripture. The who is it talking about? The second thing we could look at from that scripture is how does redemption work? In whom we have, in whom we have redemption, or verse 7, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So the second question is how does redemption work? And we are given three things that we could look at. Redemption works in Christ, in Christ. We have to be in Christ, in whom we have re redemption, in whom we have, in Christ. So redemption works in Christ. You cannot be out of Christ and have redemption. So we don't want to knock anybody's faith, anybody's religion, but it comes down to the fact that if you are not in Christ, you are not redeemed. You cannot be redeemed because redemption works in Christ. You have to be in Christ. In Christ, we have a lot of things. In Christ, we have a, a lot of privileges. In Christ, we are in a very, very good position. And in Christ, we have our redemption. So if you are out of Christ, in order to have redemption, you need to be in Christ. A second thing in that scripture, redemption works through blood. And it works through blood it says in whom we have redemption through his blood so it works through blood now not just any blood but the blood of the only sinless mediator between god and man which is jesus christ sorry who is jesus christ the righteous so it works through blood but not just any blood the blood of the only sinless mediator between god and man Jesus Christ the righteous. Book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 tells us, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And throughout the Bible, as we read through the episodes, as we read through the, the Old Testament, and we see the progression of humanity as we came through, we would see that uh, there is always uh, the need for blood sacrifices to bring about cleansing and to bring, a, to bring about atonement from sin. So blood is required. Now Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Of course, the lamb in the sacrificial system had to be without blemish. And Jesus Christ was without blemish. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the perfect lamb of God. So his blood was required to be shed for redemption to work. Additionally, the old covenant, the covenant of the law was going to be done away with. And the new covenant in Christ was being instituted. A new testament required the death of the testator for the, for the covenant to be sealed. And hence Jesus had to die and shed his blood so that the new covenant could be sealed and established. So, so it works in Christ because we have to be in Christ and it works through blood, through the blood of Jesus Christ. No other blood could provide redemption. The blood of animals did it for a while in a type and in a shadow of something better and greater that was to come. But there is nothing that has the efficacy as the blood of Jesus Christ. It is only the sinless blood, the sinless shed blood of Jesus Christ that could achieve redemption. A third thing in that verse is that redemption works 
according to grace. Meaning that it isn't earned. We are redeemed, but guess what? We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We could do nothing to merit it. It is a grace of God. It is a favor of God extended towards humanity. So when we look at this here, this is all about God. In Christ, through his blood, and according to the grace. Christ did all of the work here for our benefit. And we should give God thanks for redemption. Redemption, that's how redemption works. So let's ask a third question. From what are we redeemed? And this is an important part of what we say in here today. From what are we redeemed? If we are redeemed, then from what are we redeemed from? And three things we want to talk about here. We are redeemed, according to our verse, we have the forgiveness of trespasses or guilt from sin. So we are redeemed from guilt, the guilt from sin. Because none of us can say that we are without sin. We are born of a sinful nature, as we have already said. We are born of an Adamic nature. Sinful we are by nature. And our sin separates us from God. And because of this, we need redemption. The redemption provides forgiveness. And I want us to note that this redemption, this forgiveness of sin, happens immediately as the believer receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Or forgive our sins are forgiven immediately when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, forgiveness of trespasses. I want to share briefly, I want to read two scriptures, two sets of scriptures that's going to tell us or show us what is the real problem, the real danger with transgressions? And I hope that we will understand this. I'm reading three verses from Ephesians chapter 2. And it says from verses 1 to 3, it says, And you had he quickened, speaking about believers, and you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's us before we were saved. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And I want you to note this phrase. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This is telling us that when we are in transgression, when we are still caught up in transgression, we are by nature the children of wrath. Now listen to what Ephesians 5 and verse 6 says. It says, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Those two scriptures together are saying that if we are in transgression if we are still in sin holding on to sin then we are children of disobedience we are by nature the children of wrath and the five and six of ephesians is telling us that the wrath of god is going to come upon the children of disobedience if we don't come out of that trespasses if we don't come out from sinful living we are going to have to face the wrath of god and that's a real danger of transgression but thank god that in redemption we have forgiveness of trespasses or guilt from sin forgiveness of guilt from sin and that's immediate but a second thing here i want us to note about redemption is that we are progressively being redeemed from a futile way of living and this part of redemption is ongoing. So one part is immediate when we give our hearts to the Lord, but there is a continuous work of redemption. We are being redeemed from a futile way of living. I'm going to share some scriptures uh, to go through that with. And uh, look at what the King James Version of 1 Peter 1.18 says. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. That's important. The price of our redemption was the blood of Jesus Christ. 
We are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now listen to that in the NIV. It says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as gold or silver that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. So, what we would have inherited from our ancestors would have been an empty way of life, meaning that we would have been living a life of emptiness, a life that brought no pleasure, a life that did not satisfy God. They were taught and they were schooled and they were trained in a particular way that we have received. But all of that amounted to vanity, vain conversation and emptiness. And so now, after we have received forgiveness of sins, we are being worked upon. Redemption is at work in us. As our bishop would say, we are work in progress. We are progressively being redeemed from that futility, from that idle, from that non-productive way of living. And without redemption, we would still have been stuck in our old ways, living sinfully and living in futility. But because of redemption, we are no longer conformed to this world, but we are renewed. And the kingdom becomes alive in us because we are now partakers of the king of the kingdom. And I want us to know that this redemptive work is not yet completed in us. So we are still being redeemed. Even as we live and breathe today, we are still being redeemed. So... It's immediate and it's progressive. And the third thing about it is that it also goes into the future. We are redeemed from the future defects and deficiencies of our body and soul. And that's a future work of redemption. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and it's on the screen, it says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Promise not yet fully fulfilled. Which is the earnest of our inheritance, a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of, of uh, his glory. You know, one day, we will fully belong to Christ. One day we will be with him. We will be where he is. He will be with us. We will rule. We will reign with him. We will be like as he is in his own form and fashion. We haven't achieved that as yet. It is promised. It is promised to us. And God is a, a God of faithfulness. It will happen. It is in our future. And redemption also has a future aspect. This part of it, this promise will be fulfilled in the future, in things to come. Wouldn't be too long again before it is fulfilled, but redemption affects us immediately when we give our hearts to the Lord. It affects us while we are in the process during life. We are being redeemed every day, and it also has a, a, a dimension in our future. If you look at Luke 21 and 28, look at this verse. It says, and when these things begin to come to pass, signs that people are seeing, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draw it nigh. We have not yet had this future part of redemption. It is on the way. We are going into it. And uh, Romans 8, 23 from the, the New Living Translation, it reads, as, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit with us, within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he has promised us. If we are sick, if we are not well, if our bodies are lacking, if we are uh, 
suffering know that part of our redemption in the future will be new bodies different bodies glorified bodies and souls that will be free from pollution of immorality and all things like that it's part of our future redemption we are redeemed from future defects and deficiencies of our body and soul and that's in the future so we have immediate when we give our hearts to the lord we have ongoing as we live and we have redemption also in our future where our bodies and souls will also be redeemed all right and the last thing i want to share in just brief point form uh some of the benefits of redemption so i'm just going to share this in bullets and share this scripture but i'm not going to go through uh the scripture the one hold on a sec please right eternal life so we have eternal life a benefit of redemption eternal life forgiveness of sin which you went through these are benefits righteousness we will have righteousness as a benefit of redemption freedom from the curse of the law freedom from the curse of the law we have adoption into god's family adoption into god's family deliverance from the bondage of sin we have peace with god through redemption and we have the indwelling of the holy spirit through redemption so these are some of the benefits of redemption i want us to look at that list eternal life forgiveness of sins righteousness freedom from the curse of the law adoption into god's family deliverance from the bondage of sin peace with god and the indwelling of the holy spirit and i want to ask you a question for you to answer yourself do you think we could really live without these benefits and if so we should see how much we needed redemption because if we did not have redemption we could not have anything from on that list but because of redemption in christ and through his blood by grace this is what we have as the benefits of redemption so we would have been nothing without redemption we thank god for redemption we thank god that redemption was not an afterthought redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction redemption was always god's plan the bible says that before the foundation of the world before the foundation of the world that this plan was already established not for plants not for animals not for the fallen angels or even lucifer but for us man so we it brings us to wonder how much god really loves man and let me just conclude this here is a vision that the streets of heaven will be filled with former captives who through no merit of their own nothing that they did of their own find themselves redeemed forgiven and free slaves to sin former slaves to sin who were condemned to eternal separation from god have become saints you and i in our former state slaves to sin who were condemned to eternal separation from god have become saints because of the redemptive work of god and the beautiful scripture psalm 107 verse 2 it says let the redeemed of the lord say so now he doesn't want you to say so it means let the redeemed of the lord say i am redeemed of the lord that's what it means let the redeemed of the lord say so whom he had redeemed from the hand of the enemy you see whose hand you were in you were in the hand of the enemy but our lord redeemed us he redeemed our lives from destruction he redeemed us from the hand of the enemy and so my final words is for us to declare declare that you are redeemed he says say so declare that you are redeemed understand what it means to be redeemed because there was a process and there was a price there was a plan and we fit into the beneficiaries of that plan but it cost god a lot to redeem us yet he did it willingly 
and tell others. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell others about your redemption. And more importantly, tell others about your gracious Redeemer, the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath redeemed us from the hands of the enemy. So that brings me to the end of uh, this presentation there. So let me, I trust that you have been blessed and minister too, that you have understood something about redemption. I trust that we could go back to that scripture in Ephesians 1, 7. We could, we could take out all of the valuable things from that scripture and we could use it to show how redemption works. So the Lord bless you richly.